Whether you're working with a single printer or deploying an entire fleet, maintenance is one of the most important things that you need to understand when it comes to 3D printing. 3D printers fall into the world of precision mechanics, and failing to understand and perform maintenance can not only lower the expected quality of your 3D prints, but also lower the life expectancy of your hardware. If you're like a lot of people and you have your 3D printer out in your garage or workshop, it's very important to remember that a 3D printer is not a table saw and it's not a laser engraver. To protect our overall print quality and the longevity of our hardware, it's important to understand that both dust and debris carry a negative effect for 3D printing. Removing dust from your 3D printer is one of the easier forms of maintenance. All you need to do is use a microfiber rag or something like a shop towel to wipe down the complete frame and housing of your 3D printer. It is important to note that when I'm talking about shop towels, I'm talking about the fiber-free, blue, or sometimes green type of shop towels. You don't want to use paper towels as these just add more fibers and dust to the 3D printer. But sometimes your only option is a paper towel. And in that scenario, I would say that something is better than nothing, even if it is leaving fibers. The only note to this is don't use paper towels to wipe down your bed. Find anything else. An old t-shirt and a pair of scissors will do perfect. You do not want to use paper towels on your bed. One last thing to note is while you're wiping down your 3D printer, you want to avoid touching the belts or the rails. These are two areas that you want to address independently and for two different reasons. The main reason that you don't want to touch the rails is you don't want to introduce grease to the rag or shop towel that you're using. Real quick, as an example, while I was editing this video, I had a member of the Discord send me some of the pictures of his 3D printer. He had been dealing with nozzle clogs on and off for the last several months. He even went ahead and changed the hot end and nozzle to a whole different system. But you can see from these examples, what was happening is the machine wasn't cooling effectively because of the different dust from his environment. The inability for the system to cool was leading to heat creep, which led to clogs in the filament path. So I'm not trying to be dramatic when I say that you need to keep your 3D printer clear of dust and debris. Another thing we need to watch out for is filament debris. Now, if you've been online for a while, you might've seen pictures with guys having a bunch of filament in the bottom of the 3D printer and all over the place, and they think it's really cute. But it's not a good idea. Initially, you may think that a piece of plastic filament can't possibly hurt the metal components of a 3D printer, but that's not directly the risk that they pose to a 3D printer. This isn't a debate over plastic filament versus steel components. Steel components are gonna win out almost every single time, but where they start to lose is when it comes to the added stresses, pressures, and frictions in the system. When a piece of filament ends up somewhere that it's not supposed to be, this can add these stresses to your extruder or your pulleys or the different bearings found in a 3D printer. Stresses and pressures that they're not designed to work with. When this happens, sometimes people get lucky and sometimes people just don't. But the best way to avoid this is to just avoid it. Make sure you keep all filament scraps and debris outside of your 3D printer. Now, this next part may not damage the components of your 3D printer, but it can lower the overall quality of your 3D prints. We've all seen the guy who has a bunch of open rolls of filament on a shelf somewhere stacked up together. When you have open filament stored on the shelf, there are two problems that you're dealing with. One would be the potential moisture or environmental effects, and the second would be dust accumulating on the spool. Whenever this dust accumulates on the spool and then you place it into the printer, this is getting sucked into the extruder and melted into the plastic. This can overall degrade the expected quality of your 3D prints. The better alternative for open filament would be something like a storage cabinet or storage tote or even some storage bags. But remember, the rule of thumb is if you're not using it and you've bought a roll of filament, leave it in the bag, don't open it. Just because it looks cool stacked together on a shelf doesn't mean it's good for the 3D printer or your filament. The one caveat to this is a lot of the guys that you see on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, they're printing out parts so fast that they're not really concerned with their filament sitting stacked up together as it's not sitting there long enough to collect dust and to become a problem. But outside of this, I've seen people have open filament on a shelf for over a year and then pull it down and wonder why they're having printing issues and adhesion issues. When 3D printing, it's really easy to forget that the motion system isn't magic. 
but rather a well-orchestrated symphony of metal-on-metal -metal contact. And this is why it's incredibly important that we take the time to make sure that we lubricate our machines properly. We want to make sure that we wipe down the rails and the Z-screws of our motion system. Over time, filament and debris can get caught in the grease in this motion system, and we don't want to introduce it to the new grease that we'll be lubricating the system with. Now that everything's clean, we can start adding our grease to our motion system. Now, there's a little bit of a debate online of what grease is perfect for a 3D printer. But honestly, I just use white lithium grease, as it's been a standard in precision machining for years. To do this, you don't need any specialized tools or anything like that. At most, maybe a pair of gloves. I just put a little bit on the end of my finger, and then I apply the grease to the X and Y rails of the motion system. This doesn't have to be 100% perfect, and if you miss a spot here or there, it doesn't really matter, as once the grease is on the rails, the system realistically becomes self-lubricating as the print head is moving back and forth. For our Z-screws and our Z-rail, again, we don't have to be perfect. On the Z-rail, you just go ahead and put a little bit on the front and back and around most of the Z-rail. Don't worry if you don't get it all. As the bed is moving up and down, the rail will self-lubricate as it drags that lubrication up and down the rest of the rail. For the Z-screw, we just need to run a single bead down the front of each Z-screw. Once we've done that, we simply turn the printer on and home the printer. Once the printer's home, we'll just tell the bed to move up and down several times to evenly distribute the grease on the screw. Now, there are people out there that will freak out and tell you that you're using too much or too little grease on your motion system. But really, you can just safely ignore these people. Once you've applied the grease to your motion system, it's easy to tell for most people whether you've used too little or too much. And if you've used too much, it's really easy to remove the excess using your shop towel. Over time, depending on your printing frequency, you'll get the feel of how often you need to renew the grease and lubrication for your 3D printer. Let me mention one caveat when it comes to lubricating our motion system. Some manufacturers use graphite self-lubricating systems on the x-axis rail. It's a good idea and a rule of thumb just to check your manual to make sure that the manufacturer for your printer hasn't used graphite self-lubricating system as grease and other lubricants will destroy the graphite. For Flashforge, we don't need to worry about this as the Adventure 5M series does not use graphite self-lubricating systems. Before we continue, let's take a second to talk about today's sponsor, PCBWay. If you have an idea or a project that you're working on, PCBWay is the perfect stop for custom manufacturing. Not only do they help manufacture custom PCBs, but they also offer a wide range of services, including CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, and 3D printing, with their 3D printing service also offering industrial grade 3D printing like SLA and SLS 3D printing. My favorite service being their metal 3D printing that they offer on the website. So make sure to check out PCBWay for your next idea or project at PCBWay.com. Now that the machine is lubricated, we can take this opportunity to inspect some of the hardware of the printer. Mainly, you want to reach up and check the print head and make sure that it isn't flexing back and forth with any unexpected movements. After this, you want to go ahead and inspect the belts driving the motion system. Mainly, you're looking for any missing teeth or framing in the belts. If you're experiencing any unexpected play or movement in your print head, or you have any fraying or missing teeth on your belt, this is a clear indicator that there may be a problem with the hardware of your 3D printer. At this point, you want to refer to the manual for your 3D printer. Now, most of the time, these aren't problems that you could just safely ignore. While you may not experience side effect and symptoms immediately, problems in the motion system can rapidly degrade to damage hardware in very difficult to fix situations. After your printer has accumulated X amount of hours of printing time, it's a good idea to go ahead and check your nozzle. But we want to check our nozzle for two things. One would be any filament buildup on the nozzle. And the second would be any damage or defects caused during hours of printing. The best option to clean your nozzle from any built up filament would be something like a brass brush. Mainly, we just want to make sure that there's nothing on the nozzle that doesn't belong there, primarily filament. To avoid buildup on my nozzle, I use plastic repellent by Slice Engineering. Now, Keep in mind, if you're going to use this, this needs to be applied to a clean nozzle. And also, this isn't something you just apply once and forget it. You need to apply it after X amount of hours of printing. For me, that's about every one to two weeks, depending on the frequency that I'm printing. 
To ensure that we have excellent adhesion and to minimize any warping or releasing during printing, we want to make sure that we take care of our print bed. Taking care of our print bed is pretty straightforward. For the most part, we just want to make sure that it's clear of any excess grease or glue. To clean our bed, we just use a little bit of alcohol and a microfiber cloth. Again, don't use paper towels. If you do, make sure that you're using the fiber-free shop towel variants. Personally, I recommend using a spray bottle for your isopropyl alcohol, as it applies more evenly on the bed and it lasts longer when used in spray form. Once you wipe down the bed, just remember that you want to be careful how you pick it up, as you don't want to introduce grease to the surface of your build plate. Quick note since we're on the topic of beds, there are primarily two different forms of glue that people use for 3D printing. Those would be your generic school-type craft glue stick and the new more modern liquid glue alternative. If you've been in 3D printing for a while, you've probably heard somebody say, you don't need glue, don't use glue. If you're using glue, you don't know what you're doing. The truth is, that's not true. A lot of this stems from the fact that historically, 3D printing users have used generic craft school glue on their 3D printers. And that's not the case anymore. This, I agree, is very bad for your 3D printer, and you shouldn't realistically be using it. This, on the other hand, is a very different topic. A topic that I won't be going into today. Just remember, if you want to use glue, the liquid type variants are excellent for 3D printing. The last step to properly maintaining the bed of your 3D printer is maintaining what is underneath it. And that would be your magnet sheet. If you've ever found yourself in a rush and just forgot to pay attention, you may have had a piece of filament get lodged in between the magnet sheet and your top build plate. The problem with this is once you begin printing, this can damage your magnet sheet. Or worse, if you ever remotely started a print and forgot that you removed your build plate, you can run your nozzle directly into your magnet sheet, scarring the magnet sheet altogether. Now, I've seen users just run with it and send it. But the problem is, when you have a damaged magnet sheet, it can throw off the ABL or auto bed leveling variables that are handed to the firmware. Once your magnet sheet has been severely scarred or damaged, it's very likely that your printer is going to collect inaccurate values during the auto bed leveling process. This often leads to poor first layers and failed prints. So if you have a damaged magnetic sheet, it may be a good idea to look at replacing it. The very last part of maintenance for your machine is increasing the frequency at which you calibrate. For most modern 3D printers, when the consumer removes the printer from the box, the first thing that the manufacturer asks is that the user goes through a calibration step. The problem with this is it leads consumers to believe that these are fixed variables that remain unchanged for the life of the 3D printer. What happens is as you print, the hardware of your 3D printer begins to age and change its behavior. That means the values found during your initial calibration are far outside of their current values. Simply the act of your nozzle heating up and cooling down repeatedly will change the overall PID values over time. These values will also change any time that you swap a nozzle or a hot end, as well as any time that you move the printer. Now, these values might not change drastically, but they do change nonetheless. For me, any time that I touch a piece of hardware or change anything, or move the printer, I make sure that I go back and run that initial calibration again. I believe in frequent calibration so much that if I was a manufacturer, I would set a variable in the printers where if you've exceeded X amount of print hours, the machine would ask you to calibrate your printer again. Now, you don't need to get crazy in depth with your calibrations, especially if you're running a farm. Realistically, you just wanna do the basics, and if your machine is stocked, just use the stock calibration every so once in a while, or if you move or modify any of the hardware on the machine. And that's it, that's my list. This is the list of things that I look for and I do when I am managing the maintenance of my 3D printers. Whether you're in your bedroom or a print farm, it doesn't really matter. The step for maintenance that I've showed you today are completely universal. So make sure you stay on top of the maintenance of your machine and it will increase the quality of your prints and the longevity of your hardware.